It's the second time Musharraf said he's coming back. Pakistan's former military dictator and president had to resign under immense pressure from political leaders and the courts in 2008. It was a near war with India in 1999 which made Musharraf's high-profile career controversial from the beginning. He took power through a military coup from the then-elected Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif. Musharraf chose to call himself chief executive and then became the president. But his decision to join the US-led war on terror did not go down well in Pakistan. He played a key role in the US invasion of Afghanistan and the military was deployed for the first time on the northwest tribal border. Pakistan has taken a considered decision. Pakistan's intelligence agencies and the CIA helped train fighters during the Soviet war in the 80s and developed strong ties with fighters on both sides of the border. But Al-Qaeda affiliated groups targeted both military and civilians after Musharraf's decision to sever ties with them. Musharraf tried to sign agreements with tribal elders, but fighters on one hand and pressure from Washington was a difficult balance. He also tried to normalize ties with India, but wasn't able to carry it through after he tried to remove Pakistan's chief justice. A massive movement in favor of Justice Iftikhar Chaudhary was one of the deciding factors in ending Musharraf's 10-year rule. He tried to stay in power by allowing political leaders in exile to come back and wiping clean old criminal cases. Welcome to the Michael Brooks Show. We're broadcasting live from downtown Brooklyn, USA, where left is best as it is everywhere else with super producer Matt Leck. Yo. Chief economist, Leonard Peltier advocate, David Griscom. How's it going? And everybody else in the TMBS universe, every single human being that makes this show possible. On this week's program, Professor Richard Wolf, he returns. We're talking about China. What is the Chinese economic system? What is the history of the modern Chinese economy? From Mao's revolutionary days to the rising China of today, what economy are we talking about? Then, what does Marx's concept of alienation have to do with white supremacy, global terrorism, and well alienation? We're also going to be touching on the concept of primitive accumulation. It's a materialist Marxist orientation with our great guide, Professor Richard Wolff, on this week's program. David Grishkum is going to talk to us about a political prisoner that could have been released through executive order by Bill Clinton or Barack Obama, theoretically George W. Bush or Donald Trump for that matter though obviously that isn't where they're facing the pressure. We honor the legacy and memory of Toni Morrison with a powerful articulation on the state of this country's history in light of the atrocities in El Paso. Shout out to Mike Ravel. Yes. In Duke. Go ahead. Point your mic a bit at you, toward, toward you. What did you say? Point the top of your mic a bit toward you. Oh, point. Sorry. Am I off? Now you're good. Now I'm good? Sorry Just getting a little that, bit guys. of elevator noise. My apologies. Oh, the elevator noise. Grassroots media. Mike Ravel endorses Bernie Sanders. Major moves there. We also honor his legacy of exposing the Pentagon Papers. I didn't and know about that. That and a much, much more on the post game. We're talking about Jeremy Corman. Dominique Remy joins us to talk about an amazing documentary film that she's making that you should know about and support a debunk with the great Ben Burgess and Richard Wolf responds to and debunks his own Milton Friedman video and an update on Kashmir, all that and more on the post game and main show. But first, we have to talk about what's happening in Afghanistan and Pakistan, give you a bit of an illicit history of that region and conflict. And in order to do that, we need to understand some key dynamics. We need to understand the Soviet invasion, the US-Saudi orchestrated war against the Soviet invasion, the Mujahideen 
and the heroin conflict that fuels so much of the war in Afghanistan today. We are 18 years into the U.S. invasion in Afghanistan, which took place after September 11th. Countless civilian lives, endless injuries, deaths of U.S. soldiers and NATO soldiers, a further destabilized and significantly reconfigured Pakistan in terms of enhanced power for its inter-services uh, agencies, its intelligence apparatus, and so forth. But in order to understand the 2001 invasion to today, which spawned George W. Bush's global war on terror, we need to go back to the 1980s. Afghanistan has been at war in some form or another since 1978. First Soviet troops were deployed there in the late 1970s to shore up a communist government, which did introduce significant reforms as well as significant repression. There was a Mujahideen uprising. The CIA and at that point the Carter administration and National Security Advisor Zheb Brzezinski saw an opportunity to do with the Soviet Union what had happened to the United States during the United States' genocidal imperial war in Vietnam, which was drag the Soviets into an unwinnable long-term conflict against a local populace that didn't want them there. And while I have infinitely more ideological sympathies with the Viet Cong than the Mujahideen, and I am not a Trotskyite, in fact, I think we can all agree on the basic human trait that most people do not want a outside occupying force in their country. That is almost universally true, and obviously Afghanistan was no exception. The Mujahideen was funded by the Saudis and the CIA and the United States. The money and the weapons were funneled through Pakistan. General Zial Huk, who had taken power in the late 70s, deposing uh, Prime Minister Bhutto, who he later hung, Benazir Bhutto's father, ran Pakistan in the 1980s while he shredded through the remnants of what had initially been a Muslim identified country in the sense that Pakistan was supposed to be a safe harbor for Muslims after the partition of India, rightly or wrongly. Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan, was a secular-minded independence leader. General Zial Huk, with the funding of the Saudis, the national security partnership with the United States, increased his own personal dictatorial powers, the power of the military establishment and intelligence establishment in Pakistan, and introduced significant radical and far-reaching religious draconian laws and rules that still distort Pakistani politics today. In the 1990s, after fueling a horrific civil war and resistance there. The United States pulled out uh, without any interest in the long-term consequences of funding radical forces, letting weapons fly all over the place, and of course, other forms of blowback like Osama bin Laden, who got his career start as a young uh, Saudi sheikh helping the Mujahideen efforts in Afghanistan. In 1996, the Taliban took power, a young a uh, religious fervent movement backed by the Pakistanis. There was strong interest in establishing diplomatic relations with the, Pakistan, with the Taliban from the United States in the interests of oil pipelines. The Taliban would host Osama bin Laden, and after, of course, September 11th, the United States engaged in a punishing air campaign and invasion of Afghanistan, although, of course, key al-Qaeda forces and Osama bin Laden uh, would deploy to Pakistan. And this double game would continue. Then that would also lead, of course, to the proliferation of the drone war in Pakistan, which has claimed thousands of innocent lives. Now, as we speak, there are peace negotiations between the Taliban, NATO, the United States, and Ashraf Ghani, the current Afghan president. This is in the same year that civilian casualties, again, have increased from U.S. and allied forces. This is a brief clip of Imran Khan, the Pakistani prime minister, meeting with Donald Trump a couple of weeks ago, discussing prospects for peace in the region. I've been looking forward to this meeting since I assumed office. 
The words of Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan as he met U.S. President Donald Trump at the White House on Monday. And I don't want to Top of the agenda for the meeting, the ongoing peace talks in Afghanistan. Donald Trump seized the opportunity to take a shot at previous U.S. administrations by saying that Pakistan was now helping to bring both the Taliban and the Afghan government to the negotiating table. They're helping us a lot now. I think they could have helped us a lot in the past, but it doesn't matter. We have a new leader. He's going to be a great leader of Pakistan. But no, I think Pakistan could have done a lot, but they chose not to. And that's because they did not respect U.S. leadership. A decidedly more toned-down approach than in the past. Since President Trump took office in 2017, ties between the two had all but stagnated, with the U.S. regularly accusing Pakistan of providing a safe haven to terrorists. Early last year, Donald Trump translated that criticism into action by suspending $300 million in U.S. security aid to Pakistan for what he called lies and deceit concerning the country's anti-terrorism efforts. Pakistan, for its part, has blamed Washington for making Pakistan a scapegoat for its failures in the war on terrorism, insisting Pakistan has paid a heavy economic and human cost for its cooperation with the United States. But as it looks to withdraw troops from Afghanistan and end the 17-year-long war in the country, Washington needs Islamabad support now more than ever. With peace talks still ongoing... And of course, this is on the heels of a UN report finding that US and Afghan government are responsible for most civilian deaths in the country, primarily due to airstrikes this year. The Pakistanis are under significant pressure, and they've always been under significant pressure. See, the, the Pakistani dynamic is that they need what they consider to be strategic depth against India. That is a friendly government in Afghanistan. That's why they supported Mujahideen forces. That's why they supported Taliban forces. And that's why they've consistently continued to support uh, militant groups in Afghanistan. However, those groups have metastasized inside Pakistan causing significant problems inside Pakistan itself, which in addition to Pakistani political instability, extreme inequality, U.S. interference, the presence of U.S. drones, environmental pollution caused by U.S. supplying and refuel routes have all contributed to a broader crisis in Pakistan. There are multiple factions inside the Taliban, including the Pakistani Taliban and those that the United States and its allies are negotiating with, with regards to ending the war in Afghanistan. Heroin production is also a major part of this. The U.S. has relied on the Pakistani intelligence service to maintain the Afghanistan-Pakistan border, and it has allowed the intelligence service to become a major, uh, uh, have a major role in the global opium trade. The border between Pakistan and Afghanistan is as large as the distance from London to Moscow over rugged terrain. Throughout the past decades, the CIA, ISI, and the Taliban, its earlier and present formations, have been involved in the heroin market to varying degrees. You all will remember the previous uh, Afghan government, significant members of it were linked to the heroin trade. In June, Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan and the Afghani President Ashraf Ghani held talks where Khan said that the successful peace talks between Afghanistan government and the Taliban were a quote-unquote shared responsibility. But even these talks have been derided in private by important figures in the Pakistani military who resent being implicated in the Taliban's power in spite of their role in it. And it's important to understand that there are differing incentive structures inside the Pakistani power structure. Ultimately, the most significantly so significant sources of power inside Pakistan are the military and the intelligence services, the ISI. But there is a fight for judicial independence, and there is the effort of Imran Khan that has fizzled out steadily within the last year, but he did come into office promising a Pakistani social democracy based on Islamic values of public social investment. Those things have all evaporated um, in his year in office as he's gone across the Gulf and to the IMF and elsewhere in an attempt to keep the bare minimum of the Pakistani economy afloat. And again, in a place that is plagued by extreme income inequality. So the bottom line is, is that we are no safer 
there is no better quality of life for anyone, but that there is a deep incentive structure from the U.S. military industrial complex, the Pakistani intelligence military industrial complex, various factions within Afghanistan to keep this going, even as it, is, as it has consumed tens of thousands of lives. And uh, we will be covering more of this. But that's a good primer. I do recommend people who are interested in more of this to check out Ghost Wars and Directorate S by Steve Cole. Those are both really exceptional books. Um, let's get to the shout out, shall we? I'm looking for a remix. And now the shout out, shout out, shout out, shout out, shout out, shout out. I love ideas that turn to low because it's quickly moving into the hot position. And now the show. Shout out. the video. Shout out, shout out. Recovery into the hat. Shout out. My brain is shout out. Shout out. Geopolitical politics. Shout out. Competition would start kicking in. Shout out. I'm not funded by the Koch brothers. Shout out. Do some research for yourself. Shout out, shout out, shout out, shout out, shout out, shout out, shout out. Whew. Dave Rubin is not bright, folks. Uh, August 20th, I don't know how much, like, as I make the final revisions on my book, it's like, obviously I'm not going to actually write anything on Dave Rubin's book, but there just will be a couple of pages on just the comedic concept of Dave Rubin having a book. Is it too late to uh, change the name of your book? Cause I have a suggestion. It's not too late. In fact, suggestions are welcome. Very mixed feedback on the working title, which surprised me. I thought it was good, but I'm open to Smart suggestions. Uh, I think you should call it Burn Dave Rubin's Book. <laughs> <laughs> Little bit off the track of what, what we're doing. Remind but, uh, me, what, uh, what was the uh, title again? Against the Web. Cosmopolitan Socialist Answer to the IDW and the New Right. I like the, what I like about that is that it sort of future proofs it and doesn't tie to it. Like, I think these guys important. are swirling in the drain. They're a swirling. Bit. So their arguments are going to be the arguments we're going to be dealing with for decades and decades. That's why they're relevant. But as a brand proposition, it's, it's super shaky. Although the thing is though, is that when you have funding structures in place and a certain tribe behind you, like, it's cooling now, but like there's going to be a documentary about Peterson in the fall, like a pro Peterson documentary. I, know, I think so. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's some resiliency to it, right? But worse than that, even if those four guys disappeared tomorrow, the Weinstein brothers or whatever else, the idea, oh. the idea infrastructure is what we're going to be dealing with. If you want to something a funny dynamic that I think our fans should maybe. Um, you know, prod out a little bit is how uh, Eric Weinstein's uh, new show, The Portal. If you listen to his first episode with really Peter Thiel, the portal? yeah, it's called The Portal. Oh I listened God. to the first episode with Peter Thiel, and it is exactly Dave Rubin's show. It's them talking about, well, you wouldn't think we would agree on this stuff, but uh, we actually do agree on this. Wait, why wouldn't they disagree on that? Well, stuff? because uh, Weinstein is a leftist. Oh, don't, yeah, don't you know? Super left, right, right. Yeah, and and that's well, so funny. I voted for Al Gore. But both of you and I agree that we should uh, tag Nicaraguans with uh, electronic plates. Exactly. And you're a Democrat. Yeah, down to glossing over the thought. financial relationship between the two. Right. <laughs> Doesn't he actually work for Peter He's Thiel? He's the managing partner at Teal Capital. So I wonder how they're able to get along so well. Yeah, it's shocking. Making huge cash. On Palantir. <laughs> we're able to get, yeah, we're able to get along by profiting off of the, like private surveillance apparatus of the United States as a leftist and making an insane amount of money off of it. But some, somebody should go through and clip comparisons between how Weinstein introduces his conversation with Teal and any Dave Rubin conversation ever. Cause it's it, Weinstein's just stealing Rubin's thing. Oh my God, it. Dave, and Dave, Dave, realize what's happening. Realize buddy. what's happening. They're going to throw you overboard. See, buddy. that's what's happening. They're pretending they're all this like, Oh, stop making fun of Dave. Meanwhile, they're taking your whole shtick. You dummy. Yeah. Like look like, out. Oh, we did. We, should we really like come to Dave's defense here or should we just groom somebody better who's less of an like sort of Someone obvious that we idiot. can pretend yeah. is super smart. Yeah. Mm. I, we really do need to do a style guide for impressions at some point because the Peter Thiel impression is hysterical, but it's like, it goes back to like the Gawker case Yeah, and we need to explain the right wing Mandel. No, I'm serious. We literally need a style guide for impressions on the show because there's a lot of new people. We need a wiki for canon lore or whatever Seriously. they call it. Yeah. All right, 
Shout out Mike Gravel. So, you know, I I think we were pretty transparent. Look, I I take this race incredibly seriously. I was really pissed, and the DNC is absolutely violating its own rules that Mike Gravel isn't on that stage. And if John Delaney and Klobuchar and all these other idiots and jokers are on stage, it is a disgusting shame that Mike Ravel, who outpolled all of them, who has accomplished more in his career than any of them, who has much more important things to say about the military industrial complex, about U.S. foreign policy than any of them. It is an absolute shame he wasn't on that stage. But I didn't, you know, we didn't give him a huge amount of attention because, look, I, I'm sorry. Electing Bernie Sanders is a is a to use Teal Weinstein like a language. It's an inflection point. And it is a major uh, potential, uh, I would call it a mega application in dealing with our world systems crisis today. So I, I take this race really seriously. And frankly, you'll see that like, I don't bend over backwards to always do a lot of like, oh, but Elizabeth Warren has good ideas too. Like, no, I'm a democratic socialist. Bernie Sanders and the movement that that campaign represents is unparalleled opportunity. So I didn't cover Gravel heavily because I'm not going to cover any other candidate heavily. This endorsement that Mike Gravel did of Bernie Sanders was sharp, to the point, beautiful and clear. And then we're going to play some archival footage of Mike Gravel putting the Pentagon Papers that revealed the lies about the US, the U.S. government was telling during the slaughter in Vietnam. We'll play those two uh, clips back to back. But first, Gravel endorsing Bernie. My name is Mike Gravel. I'm proud and honored to endorse Senator Bernie Sanders for the presidency of the United States. Bernie has a program that benefits all Americans, not just the 1%. He will be a great president for all Americans. <laughs> we have a simple choice. We can have a democratic socialism of Bernie Sanders to benefit all Americans, or we can have Republican socialism, which benefits the 1% and leads us to a constant state of war. The choice is yours. Also, as always, of course, props to the Gravel kids. They did an amazing job. Those kids are geniuses. Those kids, uh, they put them in a lot of good work, I think. They're uh, really good. They know exactly sort of how to do this shit. You what know, are they doing next? In capitalism, where you give credit to the figurehead sort of leader, like those kids, I think, deserve as much credit as Gravel. Unending like, credit. I think they can do Gravel is the it. vehicle, but they drove that thing. They're ha awesome. Having a blue check mark uh, Twitter account coming out against the you know U.S. media in general was absolutely incredible for the past. And just those like awesome it. tweets, were, like they would just—I don't even remember, the, but just like the general like. You're like, fuck you, Chuck Todd, from like blue check mark, like you're saying, David. Like, you know, yeah, like, you know, they've all decided that Mike Gravel isn't serious anymore because he makes too much sense. But like, it's still a U.S. senator saying, like, oh, blow me, John Delaney. Shut the fuck up. Get the fuck out of here, loser. Yeah, I think if we're assessing the, uh, the run there, A plus, guys, good work. A plus. All right. This is Mike Gravel. This is um, basically what he was able to do. And Emma Viglin, our uh, great friend Emma Viglin, who's, of course, check out all of her work. She's brilliant and a regular on this show and a great reporter. She uh, flagged this. He read 4,100 pages of the Pentagon Papers. These were the papers that Daniel Ellsberg released in the New York Times as a whistleblower because the reality of Vietnam was totally contrary to what the U.S. government was saying about Vietnam. And he used... His congressional, his senatorial privilege, basically, uh, you know, this is the time Nixon was trying to put Ellsberg in jail for doing this. They were trying to shut down copies of the New York Times. I mean, it's not nearly as bad, but it was certainly the precursor to the prosecution of Julian Assange and other journalists. And so could you imagine a U.S. senator doing this now? I'm going to read, uh, you know, the revelations of U.S. civilian killings in Afghanistan on the Senate floor. Not likely. Mike Gravel did it. The papers do not support our public statements. The papers do not support our best intentions. The papers prove that for 20 years, and certainly for the last 10 years, we have been victims of our Southeast Asia policy, not masters of it.
There you go. Shout out. Props to Mike Gravels. Props to the Gravel kids. Obviously, I'm sure they're still not going to. They're still going to be using the hell out of that great Twitter account. Um, look. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about why everybody should become patrons and about our Chicago show, which is super close. How you guys feeling about the Chicago show? Finally got my uh, my trip book act booked. Actually, feeling very excited about. It. I uh, I was in Chicago last year around the same time, uh, and I really like that city, so I'm looking forward to it. I had a great I'm time. I'm stoked. I got a bottle of Malort, which we'll have to try if you guys haven't had it before. In preparation, we will definitely try it. I haven't had it before. It's very rough, good uh, Scandinavian liquor. That's very popular. Oh, yeah, bars I, will, I do want to Chicago. Try, I do want to try that. Uh, I'm sure. I bet Chuck Mertz will want to try that. Truck Merritt's, uh, look, he's going to be our guest along. I mean, you know Gene Bajlan, brilliant guy, international relations impresario. We're going to we're going to have fun. We'll also certainly be talking about Kurdistan as as Turkey um, amps up its uh, colonial imperial focus there. Uh, Gene Bajlan, Chuck Mertz is an icon of Chicago. I mean, if you are a leftist in that city. He's been doing an incredible public radio show. And I mean, I should say like community radio show. Now podcast, Patreon, like everything else since the mid nineties. And he's interviewed everybody. I'm, I'm listening. A historian, Gerald Hurd recently. He had a great guest. I forget her name, unfortunately, but they did a great P, uh, interview on the uh, Carnation Revolution in Portugal. I wanted to do uh, uh, one after listening to that. He's interviewed, of course, you know, people like Noam Chomsky. But in addition to such great content, he was also kind of a pioneer in like, he's a funny guy. Um, and it's a really good show and it's a great Chicago institution. So I was really excited that he was down to join us and bring his community in on it. At these shows, we play games, we do contests. Uh, it's a very fun atmosphere. I'll say this, we sold out and packed LA and New York. People were standing. Chicago were like, we're a little over halfway sold out. So it's not at the same scale. And I just want you guys to show up in the same way that LA and New York did. If the previous pattern applies, the next couple of weeks will take off and a ton of tickets will be sold. But I just want. I, Frank, I want Heartland love. I don't want just TMBS Coastal Elite love. <laughs> we are really excited about the Chicago show. I've had a great time in Chicago. I was only there briefly, but caught a Cubs game. Had a good time. It's a nice city. We're excited to come out there. Uh, can you put up on uh, screen, Matt, where people can find their tickets? Just so they have that all squared away. Because, I mean, why wait? Just go buy your goddamn tickets now, huh? I'm sorry, I'm really testing the new YouTube algorithm. Um, well, like, I, I did enough serious content about Southeast South Asia. Can I speak now? All right, this is at Lincoln Hall. And uh, uh, Lincoln Hall, August 24th, Saturday, August 24th, Michael Brooks Show live in Chicago at Lincoln Hall. That's where you get your ticket. And we'll see you there. Also, uh, while we have the pitch music on, we just did get a $100 super chat from <clears throat> Beerfart68, who says, I agree with Mike about the root cause of gun violence in America being Sam Harris hitting on my Muslim bros. Sorry, that's the, mu that's the shrooms talking. Seriously, do y'all think prescription meds are partly to blame? The proceeding was for having Professor Wolf and then three fists. So... So that I'm not really all, sure beer, what you're asking. It doesn't there, matter. But, it's uh, all brilliant. Good it all job, makes total Fart sense. Uh, everybody should follow his lead. Definitely hit us with a super chat donation. Thank you, Beer Fart. You're a genius. Um, I'm trying to tease this out. No, actually, so the pharmaceutical thing is not total BS. I that that is. I I have heard that in a couple of different cases that there there are side effects linked to certain medications which could play a role i would say it's not a defining role it's not um it's not white supremacy it's not alienation it's not capitalism it's not guns but 
uh, could be in the mix. And I also understood a negative Sam Harris sentiment from it. And so I would certainly like to echo that as well. <laughs> I'm telling you, I the Sam Harris chapter is done. And then every day there's some new idiocy that emanates from this guy. Like, um, uh, Ina. Ina Muhammad. Ina Muhammad tweeted a thing. I'll just say this briefly and I'll do the pitch. She tweeted a Sam Harris thing today where today or in some recent podcast, he's saying about the Christchurch shooter that like, oh, it's just some random loser, lun like lunatic, right? And so what is stunning? I mean, it shouldn't be stunning, but it's like he was so dense that he he never understood. People like me would say, no, it's not that ideology doesn't matter. Of course, like there's a horrific toxic ideology that permeates a group like Al Qaeda. But you have to, first of all, understand that there's not one ideology in Islam. And then secondly, you need to look at the broader forces that contribute to an ideology flourishing, right? Which of course he always just reduced to the one-to-one -one relationship between US foreign policy and terrorism, which was never, I mean, that's definitely part of it. And anybody who dismissed that as being grossly naive, but it, that wasn't even as simple as that. It was like also, you know, the role of what type of, you know, Islamic training was funded across the world and all this sorts of stuff. But anyway, I'll just stop by saying the comments that I have seen and granted, I have definitely given myself a pass from listening to that guy's podcast since I finished this chapter. The quotes that I have seen, because I know, of course, everything's out of context, but the out of context quotes that I have seen would suggest that not only can he not see the obvious parallels, he he can't even do like the other, like he, he can't even do what he dismissed. It's either like all ideology all the time or all nothing randomness all the time. So anyways, he's a putz. Thank you, Beer Fart. Uh, guys, uh, uh, first of all, I just want to say, um, you know, every time at the first of the month, you definitely have to make sure that your card's up to date, your PayPal's up to date. We're actually pretty much back up to where, but we, it was really nice. We, we crossed that 2,500 threshold. So we want to get right back above that 2,500 threshold. And of course, obviously power our way uh, to the next main goal, which is our first 3,000 patrons, which is significant. It's going to help us a lot. Um, I mean, you could see as soon as we crossed 2,000, we've already buffed out what we're doing. The production has improved. More things are going around and being invested in. And that will happen again at 3,000. Um, but just make sure your cards are up to date, everything else. And the only other thing I would say, and I know I promise this every week, we really have to do this, but uh, there's like spreadsheets of the illicit history's idea primers on everything from international law, the history of Jamaica, the history of Brazil, but introductions to thinkers like CLR James. CLR James is someone you need to read to understand the world we're in today. Um, the post games are really fun. We're having an incredible time and you're part of it. Uh, and you also do really get to interact with and kind of see people, you know, it's a different mode when Trevor Beaulieu or Bashkar Sunkar or Anna Kasparian or Big Waz or Richard Wolf or, I mean, Matt Taibbi. We get, you know, Emma Viglin, Malika Jabali. We get these hitters and, uh, and they have fun with us in the post game. So join us. If you can do it, do it now. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Um, let's talk about Toni Morrison briefly, and then we'll get to the gem. So Toni Morrison is somebody that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to uh, claim falsely. I, I think I read her briefly in college, but she is someone who, you know, I will take the sadness of this day actually as an opportunity to remind myself to read her. Um, incredibly important novelist, incredibly important thinker, contributor in the American scene. Have you, have either of you guys read much uh, of Toni Morrison? I've read jazz um, as far as her fiction goes, but the, what I'm most familiar with as part of uh, 
your you know um, research for literary hangover is your book plain in the dark whiteness and the literary imagination which is um, I don't know if people have read Ralph Ellison's um, oh now I'm blanking the name invisible of that book man. Invisible Man but there's a scene in that book where they're making white paint and the key ingredient for that white paint is actually blackness black paint Mm -hmm. and tony morrison really gets at that and how like throughout american literature like the 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 role that blackness plays is is a defining thing and she i mean she understood that as well as anybody i think that's ever lived in this country so i just want to say i mean obviously you know i don't want to shoehorn uh a lot into this and there's a lot more to say about uh the terrorism that we saw in El Paso, and I use that word advisedly with some ambiguity, frankly, because I would like to shrink the use of that word. But frankly, that meets any objective definition of how you would use that word. I was on the Hill this morning. I apologize in advance for the bad sound quality, but it was a very good interview. And there's no contradiction. In fact, not only is there no contradiction between understanding alienation the material roots, the capitalist byproducts, when Bill Fletcher Jr. calls uh, right-wing populism the the herpes of capitalism. Not only is there no contradiction between understanding the history and the reality of white supremacy and those conditions, in fact, understanding that synthesis and the mutuality of that relationship is essential to any proper strategy to defeat it and unwind it in society. And this is part of that broader education process. Let's play that clip from Toni Morrison now. This is her in 1993 on Charlie Rose. I take your race away. And there you are, all strung out. And all you got is your little self. And what is that? What are you without racism? Are you any good? Are you still strong? Are you still smart? you still like yourself? I mean, these are the questions. It's Part of it is... Yes, the victim. How terrible it has been for black yeah, people. You like that. I'm not a victim. I refuse to be one. And the victim is the other person who is morally inferior and that's who what, that's a has serious to hold question. on to of course. racism if you to have somehow to hold, that's a, for his or her own self-esteem and definition. If you can only be tall because somebody's on their knees, then you have a serious problem. And my feeling is white people have a very, very serious problem and they should start thinking about what they can do about it and and you know right and that's also i mean that's that's also in sartre's essay on anti-semitism i mean there that and you can take it in either direction there's the idea when you read someone like christian piccolini and you see a redemption, a redemption arc, which needs to be in this too for everybody, because that's the only, you know, it's the only possibility, right? Whether we're talking about ISIS or white terrorists, white supremacist terrorists. So like, there's one way of recognizing the absolute truth of what she's saying and recognizing Jesus Christ, that's a really broken person that needs to be exited and de-radicalized and and understood in a broader context as much as we may hate and be disgusted by them. And then there is like the other reality that, you know, is driven through and like the, it, it, the contempt, there shouldn't be contempt for individuals, but the contempt in the broader discourse for the pathetic small insecurity that does drive that, that you have no healthy group identity. You have no individual creativity and distinctness. And whether you're doing the upmarket IQ quackery or the downmarket thuggery, you're substituting nothing that you have to latch on to this grotesque evil history. She's absolutely right. Uh, what is I don't know if this is kind of loosely related, but we can move on if we want to. No, play. How long is it? Uh, could just a couple of minutes. This is from, um, speaking of things everybody should read, um, you know, ingest, I guess, in terms of culture, this uh, debate between William F. Buckley and uh, uh, James Baldwin is amazing. James Baldwin with the patience of the saint. I mean, this, this is And maybe, literally, I mean, that's a cliche, but seriously. This is one of the best debate performances. If you're, if you're concerned about debate performances and being owned and that sort of thing, this is maybe, I, I, I can't think of anybody who tops Baldwin here, but it talks about a similar sort of topic here. Let's take a minute of that. It's one system of reality. 
It would seem to me that the proposition before the House, when I put it that way, is the American dream at the expense of the American Negro, all the American dream is at the expense of the American Negro, is a question hideously loaded, and that one's response to that question, or one's reaction to that question, has to depend on effect, an effect on where you find yourself in the world, what your sense of reality is, what your system of reality is. That is, it depends on assumptions which we hold so deeply as to be scarcely aware of them. A white South African or a Mississippi sharecropper or a Mississippi sheriff or a Frenchman driven out of Algeria all have at bottom a system of reality which compels them to, for example, in the case of the French exile from Algeria, to defend French reasons for having ruled Algeria. The Mississippi or the Alabama sheriff, who really does believe when he's facing a Negro boy or girl, that this woman, this man, this child, must be insane to attack the system to which he owes his entire identity. Of course, for such a person, the proposition of which, which we're trying to discuss here tonight does not exist. And on the other hand, I have to speak as one of the people who've been most attacked by what we must now here call the Western or the European system of reality. What white people in the world, because the white doctrine of white supremacy, I hate to say it here, comes from Europe. That's how it got to America. <laughs> All right. So, yes, and again, the idea that there is any distinction between understanding that and the material relationships and realities is complete falsehood. And anybody who's playing that game on either extreme, I've seen, you know, I see the dumb, woke, hectoring takes, which I will still keep condemning and arguing against any form of essentialism, all of that toxicity. The ridiculous, you know, when, when someone tweets out and says loneliness is part of it and people object to that, ridiculous. Objectively, loneliness is part of it. Then I see some, you know, uh, random uh, type, you know, YouTube, Twitter pundits saying that, you know, this is a complete distraction and this doesn't matter. Our history, the racial realities of this country, nonsense. Nonsense. All nonsense. All two poles of stupidity which need to be transcended and synthesized to get to appropriate action, transcendence, and solutions. Let's go to the gym. Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, this flows very well. I wanted to take a, a moment tonight. You know, we're sort of not really talking about economics. I really wanted to take a, a second and, and talk about a political prisoner in the United States, uh, Leonard Peltier, um, somebody who's been in prison now for most of his life, um, born a uh, Chippewa of Turtle Mountain. He was one of the many peoples who were faced with what was called termination, which was a policy by the United States government to destroy Native American culture. And this is in the 40s and 60s where people were sent into boarding schools where they were told they are no longer allowed to speak their own language. They're no longer allowed to practice their own traditions. And they were all forced to practice Christianity. During the same period of time, you also saw reservations that were supposed to be protected lands losing their special status and 2.5 million acres were sold off to private hands, mainly white investors. And of course, this is a story of American racism and American white supremacy, but we always cannot forget how much of a part of that story is to try to conquest of land and to try to ownership of resources. So Leonard Peltier, as many other people in his generation, grew up through this horrible moment where they were sort of taken out of their own history. And in the 60s and 70s, there was this radical movement called the American Indian Movement that fought so hard to reclaim it. And uh, they had many, many victories, many trials, many difficulties. We can't go into the entire history of it here, but we definitely should in the future. But just to hit a couple of quick highlights, there was the occupation of Alcatraz, which by treaty laws belonged to native peoples, and they reclaimed that land. There was also 
a massive movement called the tr um, called the Trail of Broken Treaties. And that was a march across the United States that end, that culminated in occupation of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. They actually came in and they took over the government building. And inside of that government building, they discovered documents that the United States government had been um, sterilizing Native women, not just in the not just in the past, but right then. So you have to understand the moment of history that we're going to get into that led to um, Leonard Peltier's false trial imprisonment and his continued status as a political prisoner so the u.s government was so furious about this movement that because they were forced to concede to demands of native peoples they were forced to change their policy that they wanted revenge and there started to become more and more violence just a few weeks later um, a young native american activist leonard peltier was in milwaukee where he was approached by two police officers who beat him brutally in the bar and then tried to frame him for murder he escaped and went to Pine Ridge Reservation. Pine Ridge Res Reservation was a literal war zone at that time, and the American Indian Movement had been requested by Native American peoples to come in and protect people from Dick Wilson, who was the chairman of Pine Ridge, but it was very much associated um, with the U.S. government, and it was not a part of the American Indian Movement or the more radical movements for people's rights. He had his own paramilitary force um, called the Goons, who were the guardians of the Oglala Nation, and they were beating and murdering people in the streets. Um, this is the beginning of what was called uh, uh, 64 Native peoples were killed over the next period of a few years, and there were no investigations into their deaths. So this was a tragic and very serious situation that was going on. During this period of time, uh, two FBI agents go on to Pine Ridge um, to find to investigate somebody who had stolen a pair of cowboy boots, leather cowboy boots, and they drove up onto a ranch where there were um, Native uh, AIM, American Indian Movement members. There was a shootout and these two uh, FBI agents were killed. A few people escaped, Leonard Peltier was one of them. Leonard Peltier went across the border to Canada um, and then there was a trial for the, those who weren't able to escape. That trial was a tragedy of justice. The United, States, the FBI was putting snipers on top of the courthouse, warning the jury that there was going to be an assassination attempt. There's going to be terrorist attacks, and those people were all acquitted because people recognized that the FBI and the United States government were trying to have a show trial. Leonard Peltier gets extradited back into the United States under the testimony of a woman who later recanted her testimony and later was uh, revealed that she was induced to testify by the FBI who threatened her and threatened her family, and basically told her exactly what to say and a statement to say. That was how Leonard Peltier was brought back to the United States, thinking that he was going to get a fair trial after what had happened um, to his comrades. He did not get a fair trial. It was filled with false testimony ballistic evidence that um, exculpated uh, Leonard Peltier was withheld. And this is, by the way, has been proven over the years. In the 90s, um, the evidence that, um, the ballistic evidence that showed that Leonard Peltier was not the person who fired and killed um, these two FBI agents was absolutely proven, but it was withheld by the FBI and was withheld by um, the uh, ballistics expert who actually purposefully hid this information. Uh, it wasn't even that it just got blocked out in trial. It was actually purposefully hidden. So this trial I'm in sorry, itself. Sorry, David, yeah. I'm sorry. Can you go get Professor Wolf? Sorry, go yeah. ahead. This trial in itself um, was an absolute travesty. And then over the next 20 to 30 years, more and more information has been coming out about how fake and false this trial was. So now fast forward to today. Uh, we had in 2017... Barack Obama had the opportunity to pardon Leonard Peltier and make good with the Native American people, which he failed to do. Now Leonard Peltier sits in prison today. Not only is he sitting in prison, they've moved him to Coleman, Florida, which is 2,000 miles away from any of his friends, family, or community, which is an absolute tragedy. And I think it's really important that people recognize the history of the American Indian movement and how radical it was and how serious we need to be as socialists if we want to talk about changing this country, that righting the wrongs and injustices that have been done to Native peoples is a huge part of that. What happened to Leonard Peltier was, is not just a case of an individual 
um, being uh, having an injustice done to him. It was the injustice and it was a collective punishment against the people who were standing up for their own human rights, their own basic rights, and a reactionary government that was afraid of that. So I would just say that in this next uh, forum that's coming up in August, where Bernie Sanders, the first major Native American forum for Democratic uh, presidential candidate, Bernie Sanders should very loudly come forward and say that as president, he would free Leonard Peltier. Because we need to put pressure on this <clears throat> issue, not just for Leonard Peltier's personal freedom, but to also start to repair the ruins of a horrible history of settler colonialism and abuse to our Native American brothers and sisters. Okay, that I, I remember I first, yeah, I found out about Leonard Peltier. There was a really stupid movie made in the 90s. I mean, it, I don't actually, I shouldn't even say mm -hmm. it was stupid. It tried to highlight these issues. It was a Val Kilmer movie. Hmm. And he actually, but that was the point, was that he was like an FBI agent on a reservation, and he went in all like apple pie and ready to go, and then he realized that they were the baddies. And it sort of, but it, it, and that basically that the FBI was just like security subcontractors for a mining company. And so it tried to tell the story of Pine Ridge. And I remember I was, you know, however teenager, I remember at the end of the Clinton administration, there was a handful of people saying Bill Clinton should do it. And I remember at the end of the Obama administration, I actually heard that it might have been closer under Clinton. But then he went and just pardoned, uh, for, uh, he like parted, uh, what was it, Rich instead, who that fugitive hedge fund guy, Mark Rich. All right, we're going to take a very brief break, and then the great Richard Wolf has joined us. So we're going to take about 30 seconds. We'll be right back, everybody.
Um, so, are, yeah, go ahead. So, are you interested? It's a it's 2008 Turbo. <laughs> it's Eleven miles. Eleven miles, and I would just like you to sign this. This see. It. And this means that you will not be uh, enforcing the lemon laws on it. You could just then I get you the car, Professor Wolf. Thank you so much. <laughs> much appreciated. I just sold Professor Wolf a car. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Wait. Well, this that this is a, a very lawyerly one. signature. This looks like it's designed to not necessarily hold up in small claims court. <laughs> like, two can play that game. Joining us now is Professor Richard Wolf. He is one of our guides and mentors. Of course, you can find his indispensable work at Democracy at Work on their Patreon page. Subscribe immediately to their YouTube channel as well. And of course, he also is a professor of economics at the New School. Uh, thank you. Professor Wolf, thank you so much for coming back. Glad to be here. It's always a pleasure. Is everybody uh, sounding good? First of all, I always have to just ask, we don't have to belabor it, but how's he doing? He's doing very well. He's doing better. Do you feel more comfortable when he's talking about something that isn't exactly economics? No. Okay. He, 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 he ranges brilliantly across the different disciplines. Ooh, look at that. We'll cut that later to make it sound like you were saying that about me. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's do a little edit, a little Trump-style edit on that, yes, baby. Yes, yes. Um, so, Professor Wolf, let's just start very big picture. China is a place that rightly fascinates a lot of people. It's uh, everything from the sort of, you know, exotifying racism <laughs> of certain discourses. It's, it's a place that I guess has replaced like Japan of the 1980s in terms of fear mongering. But it's also, a, you know, it's not a place to romanticize or be naive about either. It's an incredibly powerful, you know, it's, it's a rising power. It calls itself a communist country, and it seems to practice capitalism as aggressively as anybody on earth. Can you give us, however way you want to do it, the pathway to understanding what the economy is of the People's Republic of China? Sure. First, what they say. They refer to themselves as a socialism, because you know most people in the socialist world did not call themselves communists. That's really more the, their enemies who called them that. It's true they were often governed by a communist party, but that word communist, when it was taken by a party, had to do with what their objectives were, not a claim about what existed. So in Russia, for, in Soviet Union, communism was envisioned as something they were moving toward and hoped someday to get to, but boy, it was a long way off, and they did not claim they had arrived there. In fact, that would have been a kind of unacceptable claim that would have been debunked. The Chinese also say they are a special kind of socialism. The phrase they like is socialism with Chinese characteristics. Right. Okay, so what does it mean? For most of the 19th and 20th century, socialists around the world basically focused on two things that distinguished them from capitalism. One, whereas capitalism had private enterprise owned by citizens who had no relationship to the state, socialism, in contrast, was conceived of as the government acting on behalf of the people as a whole, coming in and taking over economic enterprises, factories, stores, offices. The idea was simple. If you have capitalism, a small percentage of the people own the means of production. They own the enterprises. Think of the, the individuals, the families, or even the shareholders. You know, 10% of shareholders in the United States own 85% of the shares. So you're talking a very small percentage of the people uh, own everything and ma make all the big decisions. You know, how to produce, where to produce, what to produce, and what to do with the profits. And so the socialist argument was, that's undemocratic. That's a small number of people who have all this economic power. They will in inevitably use it 
to control the politics so that the political system doesn't undo their domination within the economic system. And so the mass of people are effectively frozen out. And the socialists then identify themselves as the people that are breaking that situation apart, bringing the means of production back into the hands of everybody by having the government, presumably uh, representing everybody, take over. So the first idea of socialism was that the government comes in, takes over the land and the factories and so on, in order to run them for the benefit of everybody rather than, as in capitalism, for the owning minority. And the second big idea of socialism versus capitalism in both the 19th and 20th century had to do with markets, the, the mechanism of distributing. First distributing the resources that go into production and then distributing the products that come out of production. And in capitalism, you celebrate the market. That is the institution that distributes. Um, in socialism, the argument was made, well, here again, that's fundamentally unjust. Why? Because a market allocates whatever is scarce to the people with the most money. And a socialist argued back then, which is one of the reasons why it was so popular, socialism, and grew so quickly, that this is fundamentally immoral. Can we correlate this with use value versus exchange value? In, in part, you okay. can. It's, it resembles that kind of an argument. Okay. But I think a more simple way to put it is simply to say, look, if, uh, if milk is scarce, the cows got sick or some virus caught it, got, whatever. Right. If milk is scarce... And a rich person has several cats as pets, and a poor person has several children, the market will allocate the scarce milk to the guy with the cats. And there was the, a profile in the New York Times, I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. but during Hurricane Sandy, they yeah. did a the water a piece. Went up. Yeah, right. People well, charged for water and well, stuff. People charged. Well, this that was serious. For sh I, uh, this one, I'm thinking of though is just an example of you have people who you know. This is right in the beginning. It took years for certain neighborhoods in Staten Island and Brooklyn and so on to get back yeah. on. Right. Right. This was in the Upper West Side, and people's electricity had been out for a couple of days. And this woman was joking. She said, "Oh yeah, we're we're using Zinfandel in the toilets." <laughs> so to flush great example, right? They're yeah, flushing yeah. with the Zinfandel, right. so, and it was so, a nice little adventure for them. So the yes. socialists had a field day yes. by saying, "Look, yes. m markets are not what we want. Markets are ways of distributing that favor the people with the most money because they're the ones who can get what they want, and other people can't." Right. And so the the idea of socialism was you take the private means of production and socialize them and you repress the market and substitute planning. In other words, you have a, theoretically, a democratic conversation. What are the criteria for distributing? So for example, a child has higher priority than a pet for scarce milk or scarce diapers or whatever else there is. And so socialism was take over the industry, socialize it, have the government run it, and planning. And that was the idea. Well, if that is your idea, then you can understand why after the Russian Revolution 1917, that's really kind of what they did. Not with the land, that they distributed to everybody, violating everything that socialists had always said, because they had to, for political reasons, to hold on to the Russian peasantry. The first thing Lenin and Stalin and Trotsky did was to distribute land to the peasants, who had been hungry for it for, for centuries. That's why, for example, when people say uh, socialism is against private property, I always look at them and say, do you have the faintest idea what you're talking about? The first thing the Soviets did was distribute the land, the most important resource they had, as the private property of individual peasants. But they did take over industry and they did plan their economy. The Chinese have basically done that too. The two big differences between China and Russia in terms of how they developed was that the Chinese decided early on that they were going to become an export economy. They were going to produce for the rest of the world something the Russians either didn't think to do or couldn't do because of their isolation. It's a little mixture of both. 
The Chinese were isolated at first, too, but after Kissinger and things opened up, and also because the United States and Europe didn't behave in the same way, they began to see a road to economic development by basically offering to the West to produce everything the West had accumulated as consumer goods and capital goods cheaper and better. So then the 70s, there's the political opening when Nixon and Kissinger visit Mao. Right. Then there's some con con continuity with Carter. But then in the, in the 80s, Deng Xiaoping comes into power. And what, is he, what did he say? He said something like, I don't care what color the cat is as long as it catches mice. Right. And that was the and that signal. It's, and it's good to be rich. And it's good to be rich, he even said. That's right. So and that's why it's, it's funny. Deng Xiaoping belongs on the cover of that David Harvey book about neoliberalism, <laughs> even though he's a communist. It's, right. If you notice in the cover of that book, it's Thatcher and Reagan and I think Pinochet. And then there's a guy in a mouse suit. And you would think, why is he there? Yes. And then you read it, you're like, oh, he was actually at the center of it. So the Chinese said, we're going to be the, the place that produces everything that the West wants. Um, and so they entered onto a strategy different from the Soviets. Partly they designed it, partly they had the option to do it. And, and it's very, very important in terms of the struggles now. They made the decision to be different from the Soviet Union because as part of getting in to the rest of the world, getting their stuff sold in the United States, for example, they wanted to demonstrate a kind of we'll meet you halfway. So what they did was they said, we will allow private enterprise. We will have the state with a very dominant position, the state-owned and state-operated enterprises, which remain to this day important in China, but we will allow private enterprises by the Chinese, and even more, we will allow joint enterprises in which the private Chinese can cut a deal with German or Japanese or American companies, and we will allow that as well. The glee in the West that they were going to be brought into this was fantastic. Western companies began to understand that this was a successful strategy. I mean that. The Western companies saw that the growth in wages, the growth in a market, the growth in access to this exploding market was unbelievably attractive, and they had to get in on it. And so they rushed to the Chinese, and here's what was done. A deal was struck over and over again, same deal. We want to be able to bring f production to China. We want to take advantage of the very poor wages, the low wages you pay. That's fantastic for us. We can close the factory in Cincinnati and open it in Shanghai, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Number two, we want access to your market. Why? Because already by the 1990s and into this century, the Chinese market was growing faster than the American. If you know anything about capitalism, it's not the size of a market, but the rate of growth. That is, that is crucial to, to, to planning for your future. So the American companies, for example, came in and they asked for two things, a cheap labor force and access. And the Chinese said, fine, we'll give you the cheap labor and we'll give you the access. You've got to give us your technology hmm. and you've got to give us help in getting access to your market so we can sell this stuff, which is in your interest because you're producing in China stuff you want to sell in the United States too, so we'll do that together. That's when the marriage, because that's really what it is, between China and Walmart develops. The, the two of them need each other, have for 35 years. There would be no Walmart of the sort we take for granted without the Chinese and vice versa, because what Walmart did is give the Chinese an instant distribution network. Anything the Chinese could produce, Walmart would bring into every village and town, every suburban mall, everywhere. Fantastic right. deal. But that's why when you hear today, the Chinese are stealing our technology, that is nonsense. That's pure ideological bashing of China. A deal was struck. They got the technology, which they demanded, in exchange for the cheap labor and the access. And that was a deal that nobody held a gun to anybody's head. The American company that didn't want to share technology walks away. But it didn't want to because it was willing to parlay that technology and to claim now, oh, they forced us is is really it's a crock and it's a silly kind of crock anyway so I finish to okay yeah. finish finish please. finish your story Sorry. what the chinese did is this mixture 
of private and state enterprise uh, controlled by the Communist Party in power and holding on to that power, deals to be made both by the state enterprises and by the private enterprises with foreigners for goodwill, for access to markets abroad, for the whole export focus, to work all of that out and at the same time have a, a kind of government control. So, for example, wages rose. I mean, the Chinese already knew long before Trump that to make an economic development program as dependent on exports as they had made it was a wonderful way to industrialize quickly. That's why China is so powerful. But it's also very, very dangerous because if anything were to happen to that export market, you're done. You, and that's out of your control. That depends on what the Europeans will buy from China, what the Americans will buy. Their first lesson, their shock, was the collapse of 2008 and 9, when suddenly the export market collapsed for China because the West was going through a crisis, couldn't buy what it had bought before, and that was a real big wake-up call. And they made the decision, again, this is before Trump, to refocus their economy away from exports and build up their internal market. Right. And the only way to do that is to raise wages, which is why the wages in China have gone up so dramatically, many times faster than what happened to wages here in the United States. The comparison, I mean, there is no comparison. Here, the wages have basically stagnated for 30 years. In China, they're about four to five times in real terms today what they were 30 years ago. So it, it, it's as different as night and day. And so... This was successful. It's not a question of liking the Chinese model or approving what they do with civil liberty. It, that's another matter, an important one. But if you're going to be talking about economics, the Chinese have developed their economy, an economy of one, almost one and a half billion people. One of the poorest places on this planet is now the second economic power, and within a decade, will likely overtake the United States in sheer output. This is an unbelievable achievement. It is a greater, more rapid economic development than any capitalist country has achieved by a lot. This year, for example, the, 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 the Western press crows Chinese economic growth is only 6.2%. Mm. Yeah, the United States is two percent. So, I mean, and that's been the ratio, two to three to one, which is why the gap is narrowing and they're catching up. Because in a bad year, they grow f two to three times faster than we do in this country, and they've been doing that a long time. And I think the bottom line of all of what you're seeing now is a kind of wake-up anxiety on the part of Mr. Trump and those sectors of the American economy he represents, or at least that to support him, who are realizing that this is now a whole new game, that they waited, they, they may have been able to smash China earlier if they had, you know, followed up the Korean War with an attack on China, which some wanted to do, but by now, they can't. It's too late. And that the frustration and rage and upset, it's a little bit like the British having to face that their old little colony, the United States, outmaneuvered them, outranked them, and now it's the dog being wagged well, by I don't, what was the I think tail. They still can't deal with Get that, too, it. if you look at their Brexit fantasies, that right. somehow they're going to muscle their way into some global market dominance. But is there a way, I mean, okay, so there's certainly the fact that obviously the Chinese model is incredibly repressive and so on, and that's a terrible model for the future just as our model is not a model we want to export uh well i'm wondering if you could thread two things together though could we introduce the concept of what primitive accumulation is into this story and is it possible to connect it with okay that's great they've lifted definitely people have been lifted out of poverty the growth rates are astonishing and i think one of the subtexts that Ralph Leonard, who's a brilliant writer, pointed this out, that one of the broader subtexts of all of the like in in identity anxiety across the quote-unquote Western world, there's all of the xenophobia and bigotry towards migrants from Latin America and the Middle East. But the other subtext that's going on is the fundamental discomfort that the pattern of globalization, it's not just China, 
that Asia is reasserting a natural role in terms of like, if the world is just sort of normally as you'd expect it to be over long-term cycles, uh, you know, from China to India, you're going to talk about an unbelievable amount of economic activity and power. And that is unsettling to a certain part of the Western colonial psyche. But what about the ecological dimension to all this is what I'm trying to get to. Okay, so they're getting their cut, they're growing, but how much longer is their earth going to be in you know, inhabitable? And what is the Chinese strategy for that? The Chinese have been pretty good in taking care of and recognizing that they have a serious pollution problem. They've actually taken, you know, enough? No, but they've taken it seriously. They've taken some steps. They've used some resources. I think you have a choice now, which is very dangerous for the world. The Chinese, and by the way, the Indians are absolutely take the same position. We will be willing to tackle the ecological crisis, but we have to be given the economic well-being that is the basis for doing that that you already have. Otherwise, you're going to use the ecological save the planet to keep us in a second rank. We're not, that's not acceptable. You have to meet us so that we have a chance to develop the standard of living of our people within the framework. We'll do that, but that you have to meet. And that means you've got to do more sacrifice than we do because you're consuming more of the world's resources than we are, a lot more, because of your standard of living. If you're willing to do that, then we will be willing to slow our rate of growth because it is damaging the... Okay, the Indians say pretty much that. The Chinese say that. It's been the West, by and large, that doesn't want to play that game. That haven't played the game. But is it, I mean, is it specifically, though, with China? Like, when South Africa says that, or Kenya, or even India, or Brazil. Like, yes, China's getting to the point where maybe they can't say that anymore, yes. just in terms of their objective power. Their objective, the trouble with China is objective, yes, on the macro scale. Yes. But the minute you put in the denominator of the fraction the number of people, the right. per capita is still way but right. low what we have here. Right. Right. And they, again, I don't think they're demanding equivalence. I don't even think they say it, but they certainly don't. They don't mean it. But they demand some working out. And there were the beginnings of some kind of pressure on the Indians and the Chinese coming from around the world to compromise on this, and it was making some headway. The, the decision of the United States to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, Trump's one of his earliest uh, temper one transfers. One of his first big hits. Yeah, uh, that really was a signal to the Chinese and the Indians and the others, oh, oh, we got a different player here. He's not making any deals at all. And that was before the tariff stuff and today in the last few days, the uh, currency manipulation arguments. This is now a pretty much developed economic warfare that's going on. And people comfort themselves by telling themselves they will eventually come to their senses and cut a deal. And indeed, they might. They might. Certainly is what they ought to do, and there's, the people on both sides are pushing that. On the other hand, you know, the history of capitalism is the history of these kinds of economic warfares becoming military warfares. And it would be very naive to imagine that there's something going on now that precludes that or prevents that or automatically rules that out. I don't think so. Can I we... think you're building in the direction of people making major miscalculations because they're being boxed in. Mr. Trump, in my opinion, is boxing himself in. I would never do that. He can't. Doing a great job. He it's can't, great. you know, he's playing more and more desperate economic games. On the one hand, we have a great economy. On the other hand, he's going to fire the head of the Fed for not dropping interest rates more because the economy isn't great. Right. So he has to talk out of both sides of it. It isn't great. That's why you have to do these things. It is great. You don't have to do anything. And he says the two at the same time. And even his people who want to believe in him, must be finding an increasing number of anxieties. Well, there is anxieties. a phrase that the, that the kids use, which I think is often overused, but uh, lived experience. So that, that might be running up against some of this guy's spin about the economy. 
I want to get back to that in a second, but can, can you define primitive accumulation? I, I do want yes. one strong Marxist term definition, right. primitive accumulation. Well, the term owes its, um, owes its origin to Marx. That's Karl Marx. It's in the first volume of Capital, towards the end, of section eight of that book. Um, and what Marx you hear that, is, David? Marx's point... Take, take pointers. <laughs> uh, Marx's point in that uh, section is to say there's the accumulation of capital happens in two different ways. Mm -hmm. One way is built into capitalism. It's the capitalist getting as much profit as he can and plowing it back into the business. That's capitalist accumulation. But capital also has to accumulate in a sense before we have capitalism to kind of get the ball rolling to get cap you have to have on the one hand a bunch of people who have some wealth in their hands and another bunch of people who have nothing because then a deal will be struck those who have nothing are in danger of dying because they have nothing those who have a lot say to themselves wait a minute i have a lot but maybe I can get the one who's scared to die to work for me, producing a profit for me. That way he survives, because I pay him wages, and my wealth goes up, which is what I want. How did you get things set up that way? How did you have a situation where a large number of people were desperate, had nowhere to turn, and a relatively small number of people had a big pot of money in their hands with which to hire them. The enclosure of the commons? Right. The, the process that of that is? happening before capitalism yeah. is called primitive accumulation. And the example Marx gives is England in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, where you had peasantry, the, the famous English yeoman peasants, self-employed little peasants, who survived partly out of their little land and their animals, but partly out of the very crucial commons, the ability of every peasant in an area to graze his or her cattle on the common uh, meadows, uh, to go into the common forest for hunting, uh, to, for getting wood. And there were these shared resources. And at a certain point, the landlord class took them, took the meadows, took the woods, shut them, fenced them, literally fenced them, called the enclosure movement because they wrapped, they literally enclosed the formerly common areas, denied the, pe the peasants couldn't survive because they needed that land to graze, they needed the wood, they needed the hunting. So the peasants then leave the countryside because they're dying there, they can't survive, and go into the cities. When they arrive in the cities, they have nothing. And they meet people who have become quite wealthy by enclosing the commons and producing stuff there. So, and then the, the new deal is struck. It isn't a serf and a lord, because in a sense, the serfs have run away. It's now the merchant in the city who has been selling lo lovely things to these landlords that are enclosing, has collected wealth in his hands and says, okay, I'm going to give you desperados that have come off the land, the peasants, a job. You're going to work for me, and you're going to produce more for me than I give you to survive. But you don't care because you're going to survive. I like this because I'm going to get the profit, and then capital accumulation in capitalism is launched, but it had to have that primitive pre-capitalist accumulation to get started. So when we talk, I just want to link it. You know, We've been talking about the First Nations issues like David articulates for us so well as an example, or a lot of ecological things I would like to at least theoretically think we're talking about commons. We haven't figured out a way mm. to bottle oxygen yet and sell it to those who have, uh, you know, <laughs> bitcoins or whatever. Um, we're talking about commons enclosures. It's less dramatic, obviously, in terms of the human stakes, but this is a major story in the internet. If you look at someone like Richard Stallman from the Re Free Software Foundation, he'll say that the architecture of the internet, the initial basis of it is a open commons. Right. And everything from Microsoft and so on to Apple is a enclosure of hard and software of what was initially supposed to be right. open systems. Look, the land was supposed to be right. open. You know, right. the, 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 I mean, almost everything, even if you take a simple plebeian thing, we need to be able to 
send letters to one another. We have to write a letter, send a bill, send a thank you, send money. We need a system that moves things from wherever I am to wherever you are. We call that the post office. It is a shared resource everybody makes use of until you permit it to be privately enclosed. When you have a FedEx or a UPS, they basically bite off the profitable parts of this business, leaving the post office with what has to be done. But they still run off of the infrastructure of the post office, Absolutely. which is the other great story and the, and of then, the commons. And then right? when you've taken away the profitable right. part of the post office and you say you do the numbers, and gee, the post office is not running on a profit. Yeah, that's no mystery you idiot. That's because the whole thing was done that way. <laughs> we took away the, you know, UPS does what's profitable. FedEx and, and all the other, they do what's profitable. They don't touch what isn't profitable. The little post office in every village so that we're tied together as a nation, that's the job of the post office. The FedEx doesn't have a pack, a, a, a store there. It doesn't have people on the payroll. So it's, like, it, it, it's like the fakery with the, with the railroads. Another shared resource everybody needs it so what do you do it's always sort of this this wonderful mentality in order for the railroads to make money to be profitable which is what they tried to do they jacked up the price that destroyed the farmer who couldn't afford to ship his wheat or his animals on this high price thing so all the other capitalists get together and say, we can't have this, we're all being wiped out, we're all being stolen from by the railroads because we have no other way to move our stuff, and they can charge whatever they want, so we don't want that anymore, we want to nationalize the railroad, Amtrak. Okay, so the whole logic is, you're going to help every other capitalist by bringing down the price of railroad transport, which they do. And then you have the, the right-wing I'm sorry, but there's no nice way to say oh, this. Please idiot, don't be nice. yeah. idiot. Oh, that, that is so Who doesn't know the, the history, who says, see, We're look, terrible. you see, when the government takes it over, it's not profitable. <laughs> oh, you, you, you moron, you know, what are you doing? You don't understand it. I mean, it's not because the government took it over that it's unprofitable. It's because the whole point of this exercise was that the rest of the capitalists wanted to become profitable by having this subsidized train service. And, and, and you know, you, you, you really, you, you, you're, you're beyond words. You created the railroads, put them under government control to bring down the price, which of course would kill their profits. And the corresponding profit went up for everybody who used the railroad. But the right winger wants to make an ideological case and says, see? The public enterprise is running at a loss. In many cases, in many countries, that's why there is a public enterprise, because it has to run at a loss, because that loss subsidizes the profitability of the private sector. So it's not a proof that private <laughs> is profitable. It, only some, you see, the, the yes, blindness of I this do. is just... It's wild. It is wild. Well, it's a form. I, I like the phrase cognitive capture. Yeah. I read a book once on the advertising industry, and it was a good distillation of China. It was actually it sounded like an amazing advertising campaign. And the ad starts in, you know, the not too distant past, and it's being narrated. And it shows a man who is a peasant running through some type of you know rural situation with his kid on his shoulders i think to get him a shot or something but the point is is that he needs to run miles with the kid on mm. his shoulders to get some basic medical access for right. whatever the i i don't remember what it was i think something like pneumonia or something and that and of course you know in china there's a lot of emphasis on filial piety or right. filial obligations and so on and so the voiceover is this this very touching narrative of the, of the father sacrificing, and then it transitions to the present day, and the father is happily in the back seat of a beautiful luxury mm -hmm. car, and Driving. the son and the oh, son, the son is, is returning the favor like in a Mercedes or right. something. Right. And one of the things that they did emphasize though is that that is the Chinese arc. That, that uh, is a father to son, mother to daughter time span. 
we're talking about that's in terms of growth. That's why they are such a solid political thing. You know, Americans find it hard to understand, but you shouldn't. If wages go up four times, five times in the last 25 years, if China is now peopled by modern cities with skyscrapers and all the rest of it, this has happened in the lifetime of people who are alive today. For them, this is literally a miracle that they're living through, and they look to the Communist Party, whatever their criticisms and hostilities and angers, many of which are justified, but, you know, most of the people in the world live in very poor conditions. One of the most important things for them is to go from being very poor to being much better off. China is the best example in modern time of how to accomplish this quickly. You can dance up and down and talk all you want, but that reality is playing itself out in the world, and very few people are unaware. Again, unless you have this ideological strangeness like you do with, gee, the railroads are not making <laughs> money. Uh, hello, you know. Um, in China, here's a good example. They know that at the rate they're raising the wages of their people, if it, if it continues, and that's an if, but if it continues, they're going to have an enormous population that wants and expects to have its own apartment. Right. How's that going to be done? So they made a decision that they're going to stimulate their economy since they have to provide work if the exports shrink, say because of tariffs, say because of a crisis in Western capitalism, they've got to keep their people working. Otherwise, they have an unemployment that could blow their whole blow the whole thing society. Up. That's right. right. So they built cities ahead of the people's needs for them. So you have all over China huge apartment blocks that are empty. They're complete. They and we should know that the, some of those have certainly entailed some primitive accumulation yeah, in the for forms sure. of mowing out homeless people. Yeah, moving and, popular, I mean, absolutely. totally very abusive, ruthless stuff. But this is not a but, sign of bad planning. Right, or, uh, right, that, right. That, again, is this, this willful refusal to ask the simple question, why would they do that? To which there's a clear answer. This is a way to keep people working producing, and yet it will be something that the mass of people can look to as where they're going. You may not get it this year, but you will get it next year, or your children will. We're look at us. We are creating the new China. Very powerful. So the story here in the last couple of minutes about this, 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 because it isn't just Trump. No. And, and it's interesting to me because I, I get a lot of different, I mean, sometimes I will get uh, some feedback from people who are you know, I actually really sincerely labor oriented and their objection is not to China, but their objection is certainly to the US corporate relationship to China. And they're actually much they're actually interested in, well, I would like to, you know, rein in corporations in China. And I'd also, to the extent that's possible, start to build peer to peer labor networks with my fellow Chinese workers, right? This the type of thinking that and organizing we would like to encourage. But then there's the other fact, and I played a segment on this show a couple of months ago because it was just so striking to me that Steve Bannon and Thomas Friedman, and obviously they're both totally contemptible figures, but in the pop culture imagination, Thomas Friedman is Mr. Globalization and Steve Bannon is Mr. Populist. BS, of course. Yes. They're both on CNBC talking about how, basically look, in the, when you were talking about it in the beginning, when China was making rugs and, and knocking off rush hour three, that was fine. But now China is one of the most powerful countries in the world, and they're going to dominate 4LG, whatever the hell, <laughs> and they're better than us, and they're taking advantage of the poor United States, certainly not like Google or the NSA would ever you know, be involved in any type of industrial or technological espionage. And we need to get tough. Mr. Globalization and Mr. Populist. By the way, they both said they need to get tough to make way for Western capitalism. I don't really see how that fits with the whole populist piece. Yeah. Another great stripping that the populism from people like Bannon really is just the, the chauvinist, racist, xenophobic kind, in my opinion. But why is it that if these tariffs and this economic war is so stupid that it's bought into by such a broad cross-section of the elite here? 
I don't think it is. You don't think it is? No. I, they I, get I how think, dumb it is. No, I think what they're... They've made a pact with the devil. Mr. Trump, look at what he did. He comes into office. First thing he does is assure the military that he will throw more money at them than anybody else has. So there's no reason for them to look askance at him, which they had done. The second thing he did was to give the business community the biggest tax cut imaginable at the end of a 30-year period when they didn't need it because they had been doing so well for that. An incredible gift. They don't want to look, if you pardon me, this gift horse, this orange gift horse (laughs) in the mouth. They don't. They don't want to upset this. By court. the way, that's the best Trump insult I've heard. All this Cheeto stuff. Stop. But that's funny. You know, they yes. don't want. They why stop this? this? Right. This is fantastic. This is wonderful. The, you know, when we came out of the Great Depression in 1929, the reaction of the American people in the 30s was, "We're getting screwed here, and we're pushing back." We have the CIO, we have two socialist parties, and we have the Communist Party, and they're all going to work together, and we're going to build a movement, and we're going to get lots of benefits that have been denied us. Social Security, unemployment compensation, the first minimum wage, and a public jobs program, costing billions of dollars that came out of the hands of rich corporations and people with the taxes. I mean, it was an amazing thing. We undid the inequality that had built up in the previous half century and crunched it down. Uh, We have nothing like that this time. We did such a good job in the post-World War II anti-Red scares one after the other that there is no socialist and communist party for all practical purposes. the union movement has been on a 50-year decline. There's nobody in a position to do that. So the inequality that helped create the crash in 2008 keeps on getting worse, even in the recovery. Very different from what happened before. So I think you're seeing a kind of grab it before it all disappears. And they're looking at Mr. Trump as the grab it number one specialist. And if he does weird strange and even dangerous things they're confident that in the end he'll cut a deal with the chinese and in the end he'll posture for his people that he's being tough on the immigrants but he won't cut that off and he's being tough on the chinese and tough he's mr tough every way to be really specific when you say immigration we don't care that literally, I mean, we're kidnapping children, people no, are dying, no all of the just obscene, grotesque policies. What you mean, though, is that there'll still be a supply of exploitable cheap labor. Absolutely. There'll still be people that we can take into Silicon Valley, that the stuff they're interested in, because, of course, they don't care about the kids dying in ICE no, custody. No. Right, right. They, right, they, right, they right. think that this will pass. And, even you know, if it doesn't, even if Mr. Trump doesn't come around, okay, they will then dump him. You could see, you can see the beginnings of it, by the way, because there are enough of them that are a little nervous. It's going a little too far. Um, Killing large numbers of people in Walmarts is distressing. The polarization that keeps getting worse and worse around these events is distressing. It isn't distressing enough for them to get rid of Mr. Trump yet. Right. But if there is trouble in the streets, if the people on the left hand of the society begin to become active in the way the folks on the right have, then there will be the blaming of Mr. Trump. You're not supposed to cause us difficulty. You're supposed to be our helper. Military, fine. Give us a tax cut, fine. Posture all over and beat up on the Chinese a little bit. Get a better deal, fine. But don't interrupt the business. Right. Don't make the business start to lose. And he's at that point where the Chinese have shown him we're not we're not folding here. Right. So now what is he going to do? He's going to keep doing stuff and it's beginning to eat. Even Americans that I talk to are beginning to put it together. Let's see. He makes a war with China. That screws the American farmer. He can't risk losing the American farmer. That's 10 states right in the middle that he needs. 
So he's got to buy their vote by right. giving them our tax money. People go, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> uh, what's happening here? You know, that $16 billion he's going to give to to farmers to hold on to them while, while their markets disappear. The farmers themselves are very unclear that this is a good deal, even with the 16. But without the 16, he would have lost 10 states. He, he's done. He's finished. He knows that. So he's he's being pushed into all of these corners at a certain point, it ain't gonna work anymore. Right. But the oligarchs. So if Joe Biden's the nominee, all the money will go there. They're that they're in totally safe hands. They have no problem. They'll they'll dump Trump. They'll get Biden. But if it's Bernie Sanders, that's different. Then they show that they'll still break in this no, clown I mean, fascist direction because they can't even deal with some little minimal social democracy. Or am right. I wrong? No, I think you're right. I think, yeah. you know, we're not going to see it because all of that stuff happens yeah. below the table. But, you know, the the high-tech companies that are going to be really hurt by this dealing with China, the, you know, China is so far along. If you isolate China, they're going to be more technologically advanced than we are. They already are. Huawei was not a random choice. That's a company that's already ahead of the United States in a number of areas. So you... This is not going to stop. They have the engineers. They have been spending the last 25 years, they have been pouring money into their high-tech engineering. We have been cutting our programs. You know, We have an austerity that cuts back right. public higher education. They are doing exactly the opposite. These things are going to accumulate, and they're not going to work out well. Which, by the way, is another great example, too, from China, that all of the horrific packages and austerity budgets that the World Bank and the IMF have forced on all these developing countries. And then they all say, see, capitalism, look at China. And China defended its core industries, invested in R&D, started to wait, raise their wages, yeah. have a massive role of government, and all of these horrific austerity programs that they've implemented in you know, everywhere from, from Eastern Europe to Asia to Africa to Latin America have only increased inequality and, and made it great for foreign you know, direct the, investment, I, but it hasn't worked. They, they cite China as their great example, even though China yeah. doesn't follow any of the strictures that they've imposed. I, a few weeks ago, I did a town hall for Fox News. Right. I spent an hour at Fox News, at their, it's a live audience, so. So it was me and a young woman from the DSA who were, was sort of capitalism versus socialism. Fox organized this. And on the other side of, the, of our debate, they had um, the fellow who was the executive from Godfather Pizza. Oh, Matt's ran, a big fan of his. Ran Herman for Cain, president. Herman Cain. Herman Cain. <laughs> Matt actually said yeah, yeah. that he, was, he stayed on the left, but when he heard Herman Cain, that almost yeah, got well, him out. I, he almost I had never right. paid attention to Herman Cain. Please but don't try to talk over me, which you're is what liberals sitting do. Three inches from you me. ready for a little Herman Cain? Please don't try to talk over me, which is what liberals do. <laughs> That's Herman Cain. Uh, Did he say that to you? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, yeah pretty one much. Point, he at one point <laughs> made the, in the conversation, he says, anybody who wants to get rich can, anybody who wants to get a job can do it. America is a land of opportunity. So I, I turned to him, because it was a little too much, even for me, and I, I try to keep my cool. I turned to him, I said, you know, we currently have, depending on how you count, eight to 10 million unemployed people. You've just insulted them. Right. And he didn't know what to say. So he turned, and he, he was very flustered. And finally, he swivels in his seat, stares right at me. I'm, I'm sitting about three feet from him. I said, You've insulted me. That was his <laughs> So that was. But the interesting thing about Mr. Kane and then the, 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 the others, they had uh, Neil Cavuto, they had. Uh, Jesus Christ. Um, Stuart Varney. Stuart Varney. And they had the other guy whose name I forget. Anyway, um, and that's how they handle China. You can see the ideological problem. So why is China so successful? Why is China becoming wealthy? Why is China changing the whole world's poverty numbers because it's lifting its people right. through this strategy of building a domestic market. Their answer is very simple. 
Oh, that's because they allow capitalism. In other right. words, all the good things that have happened in China are due to one side, and all the bad things are the... You know, it's a kind of... It's so childish, you don't know quite what to do. So you try to point out, you know, the role of the state is very, very big there. They own a lot of stuff. They control a lot of stuff. You still want to say that capital... Oh, you see, that's all bad. That's all holding things back. If only they were more capitalist <laughs> right, than they are, right, right. they would be even... I mean, it's... You know, you. it took my breath away. I, I had never imagined sort of adults in a room having so patently self-serving a notion of how the world works. It's extraordinary. It's, extraordinary. it's Fox business, um, but uh, also MSNBC and yeah, CNN yeah, and everything that. else. Um, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to the post game. We're going to start off. We have a very special edition of bad, a historical bad. We'll get, we'll do some Jake Tapper, but I realize the first thing we're going to start with is we picked out a clip of Milton Friedman, and oh God, is this a Milton Friedman clip? And Professor Wolf is going to respond to it, so we're gonna we're gonna throw some dirt on his grave, and then <laughs> uh, hey, he advised Pinochet. I think yeah. some jokes are in order. Um, then Dominique Remy is going to join us. She's making an incredible documentary film that everybody should support on GoFundMe. We're going to talk about that. Then Ben Burgess is going to join us for the debunk. We're all do a debunk together. And then we've got uh, Corbin, NHS, uh, and a bunch of other things to get to. Happy Jamaican Independence Day, by the way. Maybe we'll touch on that briefly in the post game. Um, Michael Manley, probably another leader that didn't make the cut for you, Professor right. Wolf. Right. You're very, you're very hard on these guys, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I so like the guy. <laughs> Chetty Jagan, who was in British Guiana. That was a good leader. Can you tell us about him in the book? Sure. Okay. okay, folks, become a patron today. It's definitely time. Double check, uh, make sure everything is up to date. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Thank each and every one of you. Thanks to everybody who makes this show possible. Check out Professor Wolf at Democracy at Work. Go to his Patreon page, become a member, support that vital work, get all the content. Subscribe if you haven't already to the podcast and YouTube content. You don't want to miss a single thing. We'll see you in the post game.